All right. Uh, how's everyone doing? Wow, there's like really mixed feelings right now. That's okay. Um, good. That means we're doing this into the Taboo series right. Um, yeah, like as Aaron said, uh, at the end of the month, we're only having one service at 10 a.m. Our ladies' retreat grows every single year, and uh, which is incredible and awesome, uh, but that sometimes uh, affects other things. And so, um, as guys, you, you're married in here, you know when uh, your wife leaves, uh, you don't know how to exist. Um, and so, that's very, very true for our Sunday services. Um, so, make sure you just, yeah, mark that in your calendar. Uh, make sure, even, what would be cool is you can, like, get together with people that maybe you don't know for, um, and then go out to lunch after. Uh, just plan it to really kind of be a neat community day uh, for that. And I think the cafe is planning something neat. We've got some stuff during services, so do not skip this one. Uh, make sure that you're here. And also, if you have not already joined a connect group, I cannot tell you enough. If you've ever sat there during church and said, I am bored, I am not growing, it's probably because you're not a part of a connect group. Uh, because that's when you get to uh, have your opinion challenged and encouraged and uh, get to hear other people's stories. And so I cannot tell you enough how important it is to join a connect group. That's the encounter part of the Discover Encounter Display the Love of Jesus. Um, so make sure that you get to be a part of that. All righty. Uh, so real quick, just a couple more ground, uh, reminder of our ground rules. Uh, today we're getting a little political. <laughs> um, so again, a couple of ground rules, because our goal always is to build relationship and not, uh, not barriers, uh, because when you create barriers, that means conversation stops. And whenever you create a barrier in your own heart, that you're not only creating a barrier against somebody else, you're also creating a barrier against the Lord. Uh, and so it's very difficult for him to bring transformation to your life when those things occur. So uh, remember, we are going to do, uh, we're going to ask ourselves, are we being loving are we trusting God, and are we choosing wisdom in our words, and our conversation, and all those things? So, uh, I'm not going to do the full review. Uh, I've kept you long enough these past few Sundays, so uh, if you have missed out on any of the messages, make sure you catch them on podcasts or YouTube. Uh, all those are on there. Uh, I don't think any of them have been taken down, right? <laughs> no? Not, nothing? Okay, they haven't been taken down. Great. Great. Um, so again, want to welcome all of our people listening on podcasts and watching on YouTube. We are glad that you're here. You're a part of our church family. And uh, we're going to get into it today. So um, we can talk about sex all day, right? Like these past few Sundays, like we can talk about all day long. We have great conversation. At the end of the day, it's just kind of like, all right, we're just going to talk about it. We can giggle a little bit. We can, you know, have fun. We, you know, it's like, okay, cool. Um, but today... And usually when we talk about things like uh, sex and creationism and, and, and Genesis 1, 2, and 3, uh, we can be act pretty civilized. But once we get into political things, suddenly we turn into barbarians. Um, if you don't believe me, just read one newspaper article or go on one Facebook comment page. Um, and it, it, it's very interesting. Uh, some of my favorite things to follow on Instagram are uh, politicians just because they have the best comment section. Um, <laughs> The things people say and share is it, it's just crazy. Um, but this is what something we have to realize is that Jesus and the gospel is very messy. Right. So much to the point where the, the gospel doesn't fit in any one party line. Right. That, that's really important to understand. Jesus is neither Republican, Democrat, or Independent. Right. Some of you have to hear that again. Jesus is not Republican, Democrat, or Independent. He's obviously Green Party. We know that, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the Bible doesn't take a, 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 does not take a side of the aisle. And, and when we, what we do is sometimes we, we create packed ethics, and we say, well, this party likes this, so I'm going to just be all into this party, even though every party has things that are very biblical and very anti-biblical. And so we, when we are forced into this packed ethic, ethics, uh, we end up, we're, we're okay with what our left hand is doing as long as we don't know what the right hand is doing. And that's a very dangerous place to be in. So our goal today is to walk and to follow Jesus in our thinking and our actions. As believers in Jesus and call him Lord, recognize that he rescued us and that we now are his students. Our goal should not be to follow a politician, but a Jesus. The Jesus who rescued you. 
The Jesus who upset the, the government and the religious. We have a Jesus that um, there's a reason why he was crucified and turned in by people in power. And what we do is we often look at sp- uh, specific issues that face our humanity and try to fit them on one side or the other. We follow a leader in Jesus who supports and both challenges his government and our government. Always remember that Jesus was betrayed by the religious group, executed by the government. The kingdom of God will always be a threat to power. Always. I love this quote. Um, it comes actually out of, I was preparing for this, and uh, the New York Times uh, published an article on, on uh, evangelicals and their political views. And it was written by an opinion piece by Timothy Keller, which is a famous theologian. If you haven't read any of his books, you should. Um, but he says this, The gospel gives us the resources to love people who reject both our beliefs and, our pers- and, our pers- and personally. Christians should think of how God rescued them. He did not by taking power, but by coming to earth, losing glory. Losing power, seeing and dying on a cross. This is how did Jesus save? Not by a sword, but by nails in a hand, in his hands. Two of the biggest issues that face us in humanity today. And that's what we're going to talk about. And there are moment of history. Do you realize that the whole world, the, the, the galaxy and the universe doesn't revolve around you? Did you know that yet? Do you remember that time when you realized that the world didn't revolve around you? It, for me, it was like 17. It took me a while. Anyone take a little longer? Like, this is new information. <laughs> but we only exist in a moment of history. And in this moment of history, we as Christians have a choice. We have a decision to make on how we're going to respond to certain issues. So the two specific issues we're talking about today, and at first I was sharing with one of my good friends saying, hey, I'm talking about these two issues. And they're like, how does that even fit together? You'll be amazed in how they fit together. And it's these two things. The mass migration of people groups and the largest genocide in human history. Like I said earlier, we can talk about sex and sexuality. We might get a little bashful, a little like, okay, but when we talk about the things, these topics, they are going to make you feel uncomfortable. And they should. One of the greatest threats that face American Christianity has nothing to do with uh, the, the, the bad things on TV or the politicians in the White House or blah, 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 blah. The biggest things that threatened the Christianity in America is our desire for safety and comfort over God's will. So I hope you feel uncomfortable. Because when we feel uncomfortable, we know God is moving. These are things that it might make you feel sad. It might make you feel guilty. And I can tell you as I prepared the first part of this message and even more the second part, I was weeping in Panera. (laughs) Good thing bread absorbs. (laughs) And it works as comfort food. Tears are a natural seasoning. Um, But these are things that, uh, if they don't affect you, you prefer not to talk about it. Um, We're going to talk about it. We all, see, what happens, we feel guilty, and so we shut ourselves off. We, 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 we keep things out of sight, out of mind. We often confuse guilt and shame for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. If the feeling is urging you to be more loving, more compassionate, more understanding, more empathetic, can I challenge you that that is the Holy Spirit? But if something tells you that you are worthless, that you should shut up, that you should not bring it up, that you should hide it, that's guilt and shame. That's of the enemy. And so we really have to understand when you might be in this place, and I cannot encourage you enough, stick out the message. You may want to get up and leave. I get it. But allow the Holy Spirit to do something in your heart that maybe you've never allowed him to do before. So, Lord, can we, can we just lift our hands right now as we pray? God, would you, would you meet us in this place? Jesus, will we, will we be reminded of the nails that you gave for us that we may know grace and truth and forgiveness god would you help us understand these these issues that may affect us that we hit away or that maybe don't affect us 
and we don't want anything to do with them. Lord, but we want your heart. So, Lord, just as you, ex- you that was what, what salvation's about, you exchange our heart of shame and sin for your heart of compassion and holiness. So, Lord, we come before you in that. In Jesus' name, amen. The two topics, the first one we're going to talk about is abortion. And the reason why we're talking about abortion, because it is the largest genocide in our history of mankind. Over 42 million unborn babies are murdered, are killed every year. 42 million let that number set in. And already I know there's a hundred different reasons for that. But just let that number set in. Abortions can occur due to unwanted pregnancy, evidence of retardations, the wrong gender. And there's many countries that male is the more predominantly valued, and so they will abort females. More female babies are aborted than males across the globe. Sometimes it's done out of population control. Sometimes it's a personal health concern for the mother or the inconvenience for a father who's not ready to be one. David Platt says this. He says, abortion has been called a silent killer, not only of babies, but of moms who possess deep wounds and dark scars from their past history. This is so important because this is a topic that so many, whether you have had one or that you, uh, or that you forced someone to have one or you have performed them yourselves as a medical professional, whatever you want to put it as, is there's such a darkness and a shame that we just don't talk about it. And when we keep things in the darkness, we're not allowing God to heal those things. And what I want to do is first take a look at a couple of verses that show us how much God values life. In Psalm 139, it says in verse 13, For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret. Intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Even before you experienced a day, God sees every child. Even when it's unformed substance. God already wrote their name in his book. In Job uh, 33, Job, he says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. And what's so powerful about this picture is we know that a baby inside of a mother's womb gets their oxygen not on their own, but because of someone else. Through the umbilical cord, they receive the oxygen and the nutrients that they want, that they need, that are so essential to the, their creation and their development comes from another that they don't know and understand yet, but they will learn to grow in love. So much as our Heavenly Father breathes that breath into us. He said in Job 121, Naked I came from the mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If God is the creator of life, that means he's the authority of life. That that is why when we talk about death being a result of sin, death is a complete contrary to God bringing life. Death itself is sin because death claims what God says that he's the authority of. So when we choose to, to whether we we are murdering a 35-year-old or a five-week-old prenatal, God sees it as the same. Anything that takes life is in complete contrast to the creator. God brings life. I love it. Jesus says he came to bring life and life abundantly. But the enemy came to kill, steal, and destroy. Do you see the contrast? Again, we have life and we have death. And God, whenever we choose God's kingdom, it's always going to be choose life. But we understand uh, abortion is not an intellectual issue. It's an emotional one. Intellectually, you you see the, the, the development of a child. No matter how you look at it, intellectually, ending a life after conception is ending a life. I, 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 for some reason, I, I don't have it in here. But within, uh, within five weeks, a child already has a heartbeat. 
fingers are starting to be formed, gender is starting to be formed, veins are going through the body, things are, this is a human creature. And I know there's different arguments on whether or not, well, it's not a full human creature until it's born or by a certain time, then it's actually human. Well, the brain doesn't develop till this time, so that's when it's actually human. Did you know the brain doesn't stop developing until you're 25 years old? <laughs> so intellectually, based off that argument, you have a return policy until you're 25. Imagine, think of all the big decisions we make in our life when we don't have a complete brain. Just saying. But the argument to justify abortion is to neglect our responsibility of God's creation by practicing one's right by violating the right of another. This is important to understand because God did not say you have a right to do anything you want on earth. No, when we go back to Genesis 1, he says now you have a responsibility. So you can do something doesn't mean you should. Just because you can do something doesn't mean it's good for you. We now have a responsibility. And so when we practice our right to choose or a mom's right to choose, you're violating the right of another human being. And I get there's a lot of conversation in this. I know there's already some of you who are staring at me who want to um, uh, do terrible things to me or tell me how I'm wrong. And then, well, that's fine. I get it. Go to a connect group. That's what they're for. Um, <laughs> But to neglect someone else's right because they don't have a voice to say stop is the same one that couldn't say stop when they were being raped. And this is what's hard because we sing songs that say what the enemy meant for evil, God can use for our good. But when we're faced with that evil, like a young woman who's raped and now pregnant with her attacker's baby, to say, God, what the enemy meant for evil, God can use for his good. That's not a worship song. That is a reality of what God can do when we trust him with the deepest, darkest parts of our life and things that we, we never planned. But this is a great thing. There's hope. That's a great thing. There is always hope. There is forgiveness. There is a peace available to you as a mom who has aborted, a nurse or doctor who has performed the abortion, to the male who pressured for the abortion. There is forgiveness and there is peace available. One of my favorite verses is when you look in Luke 7, 48 through 51. I don't, it's not up here because I wanted to get you the picture of the story. Jesus is in this room. He has religious leaders, he has disciples, all the elite people. They're there talking about him intellectually, okay, asking him questions, this and that. But there is a woman who is a prostitute. A woman who freely gives herself away so she can just buy bread in the morning so she can eat. Is at the feet of Jesus weeping and using her tears and her hair to wash his feet. And the religious leaders and these people and his disciples are criticizing this woman and saying, what, what about her? What, how, would, how dare you allow her to do that? And Jesus says, she's the only one who even offered to wash my feet. I'm in this room with a bunch of religious people. No one even cared. But it was her that recognizes her state and recognized what was best. She's at my feet. And no matter where you're at in this conversation with abortion, can I tell you, before, you, before you do anything, come to the feet of Jesus. Come to the feet of Jesus that you may receive the grace and the forgiveness and the joy that is allotted to you because of what he's done on the cross, not because of what you've done on a hospital table. But what he's done on the cross. Jesus says this to this woman who washes his feet. Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, it's important we, 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 we realize just as much as God values life before they're born, guess what? God values life after we're born. And so when we talk about topics like immigration, uh, and what's interesting about these topics, there's one side of the, of the aisle that says, uh, no abortion. But they say, oh, but forget the people who are already born. 
But then on the other side, he said, yay, abortion. But let's take care of the people who are already born. And Jesus is saying, can't we do both? So when we talk about immigration, there's, there's tons of reasons for immigration. There's political unrest, there's famine, there's financial gain, there's religious freedoms, hello United States. Um, forced immigration like abductions and trafficking, safety and environmental challenges that would cause people to move from one area or one country to the next. And what's interesting is you read through the scripture, people are immigrating all the time. All the time. It says that Abraham uh, migrated to Canaan. Joseph was trafficked. He was sold into slavery to Egypt. Then Jacob, uh, Jacob to Egypt uh, because to flee famine. Moses fleed Egypt so that he can get because he was uh, accused of murder. Not accused of. He did murder. He's a running, running felon into another country to find a, a asylum. You know, Moses supposes that guy. David fled Israel and migrated to Palestine to, to have political asylum. Daniel was forced from his home in Israel to Babylon. And there's even this guy you might have heard of who his parents were being faced with the threat of death on their life. So they fled to Egypt so he could rescue their son Jesus from Herod. In the, in the Bible, uh, oftentimes immigrants uh, or migrants, they're, they're often referred to as sojourners. That's just a fun word to say. Um, but what's interesting, the Bible actually talks a lot about how we are to treat the sojourner, the person who's going from one place to the other. In Leviticus 23, it says, And you will reap the harvest of your land. You shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner, I am the Lord your God. So what he's saying is that if this is our harvest, imagine all these cherries is our harvest, our grain, um, whether it's your orange trees, whether it's your wheat, whether it's your, you name it, whatever you, not, not anything you want to grow. But, you know, just think, <laughs> I can't even say Central California anymore. Think stuff you get at the grocery store. <laughs> what would happen is we're allowed to get everything except for the side rows. You can take all of that, and you can go harvest it, you can go take it, and you can sell it. But you need to leave the back row and the sides in case anyone who is poor, like uh, Ruth and Naomi, anyone who's a sojourner, anyone who's traveling, anyone who's immigrating, they can take from those in order to feed themselves and their families. There is already just a place in the, in the Levitical law that we're going to live generously. We're not going to take everything for ourselves. We're going to live in such a way that people can, uh, that we can share with others. In Deuteronomy, it says that we're to love the sojourner. Therefore, you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. He says, don't ever forget where you came from. Don't ever forget that you too had to travel. You too are, not, this is not your home. This is not your land. Love them. Because you were once them. Your family, your ancestors were once them. You, we need to love them. Back in Leviticus, it says, You shall not take vengeance or bear grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, uh, I love this question because the most religious person in the New Testament comes to Jesus and says, I've done everything you've asked. I'm wonderful. <laughs> I go to church. I tithe. I go to connect groups. I do everything I'm supposed to. What am I missing? And Jesus says, Do you love your neighbor? Well, who's my neighbor? Like trying to like, not, hopefully not that guy. <laughs> and Jesus tells a story about the good Samaritan. How, the, how the, a Samaritan to a, a Jewish person was uh, e equivalent to us if someone from the Taliban came and helped you with a flat tire and paid for it and sent you on your way to make sure you had all the stuff that you needed. Jesus, that's your neighbor. Before that, he says that to love our enemy. That means our enemies are our neighbors. Do you see why following Jesus gets a little messy? Do you see when following Jesus starts uh, uh, wrestling with our, um, how do I put it? The way we've been raised in our culture. 
Then we're supposed to care for the, for the sojourner. I love Matthew 25, 31 through 41. As Jesus is t- talking to his disciples. That means if he's talking to his disciples, he's talking to anyone in this room who is a follower of Jesus. He says, when the Son of Man comes, to glory, comes in his glory, all the angels with him, that he will sit on the glorious throne. We love that part. It's Pentecostals, right? We love that. Before him, him will be gathered all the nations and will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goat. Goats, and he will place the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. The king will say to them, Come, who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you, the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. And I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did, you, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison? When, God, we didn't, Jesus, you haven't, been, you didn't do those things. When did I ever do those things? The king will answer him this, truly I say to you, as you did it to one as the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. The ones we care for, we're not just caring for an individual, we're caring for Jesus himself. What I love about this, this, this picture of heaven, I was going to mention, I'm going to mention it. Um, so to all nations, did you recognize that um, he, he does not separate based off ethnicity or color or gender? He, he, he separates based off character and the way that you treated him, the way you worshipped him. Um, and it's really interesting because just a real quick note, one of those in, into the taboo subjects is racism. Uh, just so you know, if, you're, if you don't like a certain ethnicity or color, you're going to hate heaven. <laughs> you really are. It's not your place. Um, just saying. You're going to have a tough time. Um, <laughs> Now, do I get there can be animosities because of certain culture clashes and things that happen? Yes, that's why we come to the feet of Jesus and say, Lord, what do you think? Because if Jesus says, I love them, and you say, I hate them, you're wrong. Right. And so you, you continue to submit your life to Christ, and, he, and through the Holy Spirit begins to transform you. But just so you know, it is really impossible to be both racist and a Christian. Just, just know that. Just be aware of that. Okay. Wow, we found the taboo subject right there. Uh, <laughs> Again, that's just an intellectual thing. You read scripture and you see that. So anyway, um, <laughs> let me give you a couple points of application because um, we see that God finds people pretty valuable. It, we're, uh, they're his favorite. Everyone say, I'm God's, I'm God's favorite. Look at the person next to you and say, you're God's favorite. <laughs> hey? And as Christians, we're called to be salt and light. That means we're supposed to taste good. We're supposed to look good. We're supposed to be like, wow, people are like, oh, man, what's... How do they love so, um, how do how they love that way? Um, and we're also still supposed to bring clarity and not confusion. Okay, that's a big thing. Light brings clarity like, oh, look, there you are. Not like, where is everyone? What's going on? I don't know what's happening. So a couple, three points of application for you. Then I'm going to invite the worship team up. And we're going to take communion together in a very um, special way. Is number one, write this down. We need to listen. Honestly, if you apply this one point to every aspect of your life, light, the, the quality of life goes up. In your marriage, listen more. With your kids, listen more. With your, with your, with your boss, listen more. With your employees, listen more. Just listen. Don't live in your assumption of people and why they do what they do. You know what the Bible says in Proverbs? It says only God can judge the intention of the heart. So why do we spend so much time judging the other people's intentions? If we can begin to live in a way that we aren't assuming people. When we listen, when we listen we're too busy listening and we don't have time to judge people. See, when we listen to people, we show them their value. Because they're important. I've had to learn this a lot. I'm, I'm one of those people, when I'm, I'm in a conversation, I want, I'm ready to go. One, two, three, let's go. Uh, my wife is not. She's a one, two, go back to M. And so I've had to learn, and learning is interruption. I, I'm like, hey, this is take too long. Let's go. We've got other things to do. 
And what she had to teach me is every time you interrupt me, you show me that you don't value what I'm saying. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> and I'm learning, and it's hard, and I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but what's amazing is well, what, what happens when you listen to people, you begin to create a safe place for them to exist. So when we think of that, that the young teenager who's facing abortion or having the child, most of the time, they're, they're not looking, they don't want to do, they don't want to get rid of the baby, they just, they don't, they don't know what else to do. They just want to be heard, they want to feel safe, they're afraid to tell parents because, of, because they may get punished or they may get yelled at, they may get shamed, they may be, and the church has done a terrible job of this. Where they're looking for a safe place, who's going to listen to me? And if a doctor and a nurse or their friends that say, just abort it and do whatever you want, they're going to listen to whoever they feel safe. The church needs to be a safe place where people will be heard without being judged. And when we're able to do that, we're going to be able to do the next thing. And that's number two. We get to speak up and speak out for those who can't. Just as much as an unborn child is unable to speak, a lot of times, so much a, a, an immigrant who's just looking for refuge is unable to speak, doesn't have a voice, doesn't have a right. God has placed his church in splinter cells all across the world to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. To be able to bring healing, to bring resources, to bring restoration. And, but at the same time, there's a reality. The Bible says we're to be submitted to our government. Now for us, we're going, yeah, Right. Yes, I'll get there. But remember, Jesus and Paul, as they are talking and writing to this, they are not writing in a democratic society where you have a voice and a vote. They're talking to someone who is under dictatorship. Who, after Paul's writings, talking about submitting to your government, the, the, uh, the Neo, the, Caesar, the guy who oversaw all of Rome, burns his own city to the ground, and guess who he blames? The Christians. So he has a reason to wipe them out. Imagine reading the book of Romans while your king, your president, is chasing you down and to submit to your government. We are to submit to our government except on matters that violate God's law. The government's job is to promote the good for all people. We do get to vote. We do get to advocate. We do get to call senators and often officials uh, for, uh, for better immigration laws or better laws that protect the unborn. We are n and this is a great thing. Our forefather forefathers knew this, and that's why they got out of the monarchy, got out of the dictatorships, created this thing called democracy where people do have a voice, but oftentimes we have a voice, but as Christians, we decide to, in order to not wrestle anyone's feathers, we be quiet. We fail to use our rights. But this is a great thing. We as Americans, from the moment we were conceived in, in, in the 1700s, was this. We are never to trust our government. <laughs> to follow our government blindly is unchristian. It's un-American. It makes bald eagles cry. <laughs> our job as believers that function in a government where we have representation is that we have an opportunity to not only hear the word of God, obey the word of God, but we get to promote the word of God. Now, I'm not saying we should become a religious state. That is a terrible idea. No nation should be one faith because that, then that defeats the purpose. Um, because Christianity is not a government function. It's a move of the kingdom of God, which is much bigger than any government can handle. But to be able to promote Jesus in a broken world, not just through Christian jargon, but through helps and needs to actually help people. Practical things. This is why I, th I love, you know, organization like Dream Center in L.A., who they are helping uh, people from every walk of life to get help and to get healing. They don't judge them. They don't send them all away. They get to a place where they're able to restore them and send them healthy. But this is, is going to cost something. Number three, write this down, is sacrificial love. Sacrificial love. I'm going to tell you something that may not, may not, you may not like church anymore. You may not like Jesus anymore. You might like church a whole lot um, because you don't hear this very often. Um, following Jesus equals suffering. 
Sorry. <laughs> I really wish I could say following Jesus equals uh, prosperity and blessing and favor. It does. It's just you experience most of that in heaven. <laughs> to love others the way that God does, not, the way that God does, takes time and it takes resources. It takes your heart and it takes you putting other needs before your own for a season. This has been talked about to be able to help carry the burdens of others. It's hard, especially in L.A. County, Orange County. There's so many of us, it's so overwhelming. We just stick to our little parcel uh, that we've rented or bought, and we just stay there, watch Netflix, and go out to eat every once in a while. But to actually be in community is, is scary. I get it. It's where a lot of anxiety comes from. Is our, 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 what, if, what, if I meet some, what if I meet people and have friends and they're going to put some of their burdens on me? Yeah. It's hard. Aaron and I faced this um, a f- probably five or six years into our marriage. And you, many of you know our story of infertility, but I don't think we've ever shared this story. At the time, we were in the process of planning a church, and uh, we were living at my in-law's house. That's the suffering part of following Jesus and planning a church. (laughs) He's recovering from hip surgery. He won't be in second. (laughs) No, I'm very thankful for them. We received a a frantic call from a friend, a friend we hadn't talked to in years. He had a classmate, he's in junior college, who had just gotten pregnant, and uh, she didn't know the Lord, she didn't have anyone, her parents had rejected her, um, her boyfriend left, and she got, she's pregnant. And she was c- telling her, the, the friend that, hey, I'm going to go have an abortion, um, I have no one to take me, will you take me? So him being a believer, uh, knowing our story, he called us, and uh, he said, can you talk to her? So we talked to her and kind of talked to her about abortion, talked to her, you know, like, hey, the effects and things like that. And, and she said, I just, I can't handle it. I'm in the middle of school. I have all these dreams and aspirations and hopes a 30-minute a uh, uh, procedure can change, can take care of all my problems right now. And we talked, we talked, and there was nothing that she said, no, I'm going to abort, I'm going to abort, and I'm abort. And Aaron and I's hearts were breaking. And I don't know, this is one of those things I didn't plan it. I didn't, I didn't think about it. I just felt like the Lord said it, so I said it too. And I'm like, oh, what? But I just blurted out, then we'll adopt it. I've never met, th- we've never met this woman in our life. I said, I don't care what you do, but have this child, and we will go through the process, we'll pay for what it takes, and we will adopt this child. And she just began weeping, and she began weeping. She says, I'll call you back. She never called us back. Until about two years later, we got a message on Facebook. And she said, I just want you to let you know that your conversation changed my life. My little girl is a year and a half now. And she's a light and life of my heart. I can't, I, I can't imagine life without her. We, we began Facebook. We're Facebook friends. These are uh, Facebook friends that matters. Um, <laughs> This is probably about eight years ago. She graduated uh, with her bachelor's degree and went on and became an RN. And, his, and her little girl is growing up and is doing phenomenal. And they have this, their little family that they get to have together. And she's been able to be successful in her life. But very well, that story could have gone very differently. The story, of it could have gone differently as the baby was boarded, or we may have adopted the baby. We were ready to do it. We didn't know how, uh, but we were going to do it. But it takes a sacrificial love, and there are families in here who have been willing to adopt, who have been willing to foster children who need a safe, loving home. There have been people in here who you've had the bravery, you've had the courage to go ahead and have the child and have them adopted. Can I applaud you? It may have been scary, it may have been unknown, but the courage that you had that maybe you didn't know you had, that is a gift from God and you value that life. But maybe you walk on the other side of that and you, you, you didn't walk that way. There's always hope and there's always forgiveness. 
Maybe for taking in uh, the, the sojourn, it may, ta- may be taking you learning a new language or offering to help people become citizens or help other countries away from, uh, on the other side of our borders and the other side of, of our oceans to provide relief for them because you recognize that they are God's most valuable creation. I want to invite the, the worship team forward and the communion team. I want to make sure everyone's up here before I, I say this next part. Something happens in the kingdom of God when someone says yes to Jesus. It's not just a hand raised and a number on a sheet. Something happens in the heavens. Something happens in the kingdom of God that people go from um, no longer uh, separated, but now they're included. We get to share the burdens of people not because we have to, but because we get to. Jesus invites us into a community of believers where we were once strangers to God. Now we have been adopted into the family of God. Check this out in Ephesians chapter 2. It says, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. Gentiles is everyone who's not Jewish. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews. You were proud, who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies, not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel. You did not know the covenant promise of God has, had made to you. You, were not, you had not yet, you lived in this world without God and without hope. But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you were, have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. In his own body on the cross, he broke down the walls of hostility that separate us. He did this by the ending the system of the law and it with commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross And our hostility toward each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him. And peace Jews who who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. So whether you're an, uh, an unborn child, a terrified mom, an immigrant... You have a different name in the kingdom of God. Can I tell you what that name is? You are no longer a stranger. You no longer are far off. You are no longer a sojourner. You are no longer just a clump of flesh. You are a brother. You are a sister. So when our brothers and sisters are hurting, it is our job as believers in the family of God to do something about it. I want to invite you to stand. As we go into worship in a time of communion. I'm going to invite uh, the front row. You guys are going to come first. You're going to grab your communion. You're going to head back to your uh, seat, and then we're going to take it together. But as you hold this bread and this juice, as we begin to worship together, recognize this is the power that God used, his blood, his body, to tear down any barrier, anything that would separate us, not only from his love, but our ability to love other people. So let's take the time to reflect and to worship and see what the Holy Spirit wants to do inside of your heart and your mind to look more like him. So I'm going to invite the front row first and then uh, just make your way and then we'll take it together.